It's a pleasure for Blanca and Alexander and I to be with you. And on behalf of uh, Blanca and Alexander and our son Daniel, who's in Mexico City, uh, finishing his studies in college there, I uh, want to wish you all, uh, uh, we want to thank you all very much and express our appreciation for your prayers, for your financial support. And now for opening up uh, your service for us to worship with you and, and uh, your pulpit for me to share God's word with you. Um, we're going to be reading Colossians chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 2 to 6. And then you probably have that open, so good. All right. Hear the word of the Lord. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Now, there are some missionaries who come on home service and uh, they use their home service sermons to tell anecdotes and stories about their field of service, about their ministry. And I understand that impulse and I sympathize with it. Uh, we missionaries only get to see you every three years and so we have to make uh, the most of every opportunity, just like we read in the passage. And uh, we have to make every moment count. But I really want to use uh, this home service sermon to encourage you to do personal witness here in Holland. Uh, part of my uh, mission with Resonate Global Mission is to be a leader for the Christian Reformed Church and encouraging the Christian Reformed Church toward witness, toward evangelism, toward missions. And so I want to treat my home service sermons on this uh, home service as part of uh, my fulfillment of that responsibility. Now this passage in Colossians 4 calls us to do two things that historically we as Christian Reformed people haven't been so good at doing. Concentrated prayer for kingdom expansion and evangelistic conversation. We believe in these things, we really do. And maybe Maranatha Church is an exception. But historically, other denominations it's the honest truth, have been better at these activities than we have been. So this sermon might require some heavy lifting on our part. Beyond listening and nodding and shaking my hand after the service, I'd like to ask each of you to be looking for specific practical ways in which, in which we might live out this passage in the following week. We're going to be looking at this verse by verse, so you can either follow along in the, uh, the, open the passage up on the screen or have your Bibles open. We're going to jump right in with verse 2. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. Other translations render it, never stop praying. Be persistent in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Now, would that be an accurate description of your church's prayer life? Would it be an accurate description of your own prayer life? The church in the book of Acts huddled in upper rooms and to pray for each other and to pray for God's word to spread and for his church to grow. They, they cried out to God in the context of persecution and they persevered in prayer. But in my experience, we Christian reform types tend to just dabble at prayer. We run the risk of treating prayer like an obligation, that we, something that we just do before, prayer, before uh, dinner and uh, before and after each Christian meeting. And how often do we say the words, I'll be praying for you, and if we pray at all, we only pray once for that person. We even have a nickname for the intercessory prayer during our worship services. We call it the long prayer. Like as if we, sh we should get a medal for enduring such a long prayer. I wonder what the Christians of the first century would think of the long prayer during our worship services. Now we CRC types tend to be more about action 
than we are about prayer. We like to roll up our sleeves and jump right in. We get a little impatient with prayer and we think to ourselves, how can we be praying? We need to be out there doing something. That's kind of telling, isn't it? There's an arrogance that, about not valuing perseverance in prayer. It's like telling God, that's okay, God, thank you, God, but I'll handle this on my own. I'm going to get her done. I don't need your help. I got this. You know, it's Reformation time. And we all say that salvation and the Christian life is by grace and not by works. But often our actions reveal that what we really value is our own efforts rather than praying for God's grace and power to act in our lives and through our lives and, and in spite of us as well. Sometimes, and this is the worst thing, sometimes we leave God out of the equation altogether even when we're talking about prayer. We talk about prayer in the abstract, prayer as a concept. We personify prayer and say, prayer changes things. That expression really makes me uncomfortable because prayer doesn't change things. God changes things by His sovereignty and by His power, by His grace. And prayer is our way of getting in touch with God if we want to see things changed in ourselves and in our community and in our world. But prayer itself isn't what does it. It's the Lord. Now Paul continues in verse 2 with the words being watchful. Watching and praying. Jesus combines these two concepts in the Gospels a number of times and says, watch and pray. We need to be praying with our eyes open. Not literally, of course, but we need to be open to seeing the ways that God is moving and acting in our midst. Seeing the times He's answering our prayers and watching for the opportunities for us to obey and be the answer to our own prayers because that's often how God does things, isn't it? We say, oh Lord, please convert my neighbors. And the Lord responds, amen, coming right up. Well, you know what? I'm going to do that through you. And so I'm going to send people in your path and you're going to tell them all about me. Now Paul continues and says that we should also pray with thanksgiving. Prayer is not an odious task, it's a joyful one. The, our Mexican Presbyterian uh, brothers and sisters in Mexico, uh, they use the Westminster Confession. And that confession says that the purpose of our lives is not only to glorify God, but to enjoy Him forever. Enjoy God. Could it be that our refusal to persevere in prayer, to just dabble at prayer, could that reveal that perhaps to some extent we simply just don't enjoy spending time with God? To what extent do we just send Him text messages now and then and then continue on with the activities that we really enjoy? How can we get this far off course? How can we stray so far from the goal? We need to move God back into the center of our social network, of our relationships and our lives again. We may need to rediscover the delight of spending time with God, of communing with Him, of depending on His grace and, and relishing in that grace. Persevere in prayer, being watchful, and thankful. Now in verses 3 and 4, Paul asks for prayer. And in this verse, Paul does what Blanc and I are doing by being here with you all today, uh, asking you to pray for us and pray for our ministry. Now it's interesting, Paul is in prison when he writes these words, but he doesn't ask for the doors of his jail cell to open up so that he can be free. He asks for spiritual doors to be open so that the gospel is free to bear fruit whether Paul is in prison or not. For open hearts, prayer for opportunities, prayer for witness, strategic prayers. There's nothing wrong with praying for our own needs, for the forgiveness of our sins, for our families and for our activities. 
But it's interesting when we look at the Lord's Prayer that the personal petitions for our needs come after God's petitions for what God wants from the world. The humankind finally glorify His name, recognize His kingly authority, and do His will. We offer our petitions in the larger context of God's petitions for world transformation. Being thankful. And now in verses 5 and 6, the focus shifts now from prayer to action. Paul writes, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be <clears throat> full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now the church in Colossa was a persecuted church. The Jewish people hated the Christians. The Roman pagans hated the Christians. The heretics and false teachers hated the Christians. Everybody hated the Christians. <clears throat> and so Paul says, <clears throat> excuse me, be wise. That is, be cautious, be careful about what you say and don't say around people who don't share your Christian faith. But notice he's not saying, oh, don't tell anybody about the faith. Uh, be careful because we're in persecution, so keep your mouth shut. No, he says the exact opposite. He talks about conversations being seasoned with salt and grace. What he's saying is, be wise, be careful. Don't hold back, but make the most of every opportunity. Don't waste the opportunities that God gives us to tell people about Jesus. The phrase, make the most of every opportunity in the Greek is literally, redeem the time. And the image is of shoppers who go to the market and they see deals that are too good to pass up. And so they start scooping up and buying as much as they can before the seller realizes his mistake and jacks up the prices. And the moral of the story is we need to act now while we have time. Act now before it's too late. Because that person that you're going to meet today, that person that needs to hear the good news of Jesus, that person might not be as open tomorrow as he or she is today. Tomorrow, attitudes could change, or death could intervene, or the Lord could return, but in any case, it may be too late to give them the message that God entrusted for us to give to them. We redeem the time because the time is short and because if we don't redeem the time, we won't see people redeemed either. Paul continues and says our conversations should be seasoned with grace and salt. Salt is amazing, isn't it? Salt takes foods that are already delicious and makes them even better. I had no problems with caramel. I, I never thought that caramel was lacking anything until they came out with salted caramel a few years ago after I found out I had diabetes. I'm like, no. <laughs> And you know, I go to the movie theater and I smell that popcorn just drenched with butter and salt and I run to the counter and I ask for the popcorn and the kid says, that'll be six bucks. And I'm like, how much? No, you realize these are just seeds, right? They're just seeds filled with air, right? How much are you? But then I smell that popcorn again, I smell that butter and that salt and I... I'm like, okay, I'll pay whatever you're asking. Because, you know, the Wonder Woman movie wouldn't be the same without buttered, salty popcorn, would it? Now, here's the thing. Our conversations with people who don't share our Christian faith need to be more like that popcorn. We need to be so saturated with the salty goodness of the grace of God that we can't help spreading that delicious aroma around with us wherever we go so that wherever we go people will see Jesus in us and they'll get a sense of that fragrance of Jesus that surrounds us seasoning everything that we say and do and are and that aroma that flavor that we have will be so irresistible to them that they will be willing to give up anything to be able to have what we have now, 
if that's the case, why are evangelistic conversations so difficult for us? Why do they come so uh, hard for us? Well, I can think of a few reasons. One is that perhaps we feel like we have to memorize this long monologue like I had to memorize in Bible college, 20-minute uh, sermon to preach, and dump it on unsuspecting victims. But it's usually much more effective just to share a brief, personal word with people. A Bible verse that impacted you recently, a way that God answered your prayers or helped you recently, a testimony of what God has done in your life, maybe an idea that you heard from a sermon or a Christian book that has helped you in some way, or just taking the time to pray for someone. And God uses those brief words like seeds, preparing hearts by God's Holy Spirit. And eventually, people start asking questions or sharing their own personal objections and the, the barriers that keep them from believing. And then that gives us the opportunity to explain and help them come to the truth. It's a much more natural method than trying to memorize a long speech. Memorization is really good. Preparation is really important. I don't want to belittle those things. But we need to think of evangelism as planting seeds and allowing the Spirit to produce the harvest. What matters most is listening to each person, listening to their needs and problems, and connecting their situation with just that aspect of the gospel that they need to hear right now, that might be of help to them right now. It's like Paul says in our passage, so that you may know how to answer everyone, because each person is a little different. Now another reason for our hesitation about evangelism is that maybe we don't know what to say when the time actually comes for us to explain the gospel to someone. And so in, in Mexico, I came up with this little handy outline that in Spanish is only eight words, but in English has to be 10, to try to help us uh, have an easy way to, to focus. Jesus was raised Lord. Jesus wants to raise you too. Jesus was raised Lord. Jesus wants to raise you too. Now the first part is Jesus was raised Lord. And the idea is this. Jesus was raised, was resurrected from the dead and placed as Lord, as authority, as supreme commander over all of creation. And that means that he is the Lord of each one of us. He has authority over each one of us. And we all need to recognize his authority over our lives and recognize that we have betrayed his authority. We've rebelled against his authority and that we need to come to him for mercy and for forgiveness. And the other half is Jesus wants to raise you too. Those who come to Jesus for forgiveness and for mercy discover the, the beautiful truth. <laughs> Look at this fly chasing me around. People who come to Jesus for mercy and forgiveness discover this beautiful truth that Jesus has himself suffered the death penalty that hung over us for rebelling against his authority. And now he wants to lift us up Lift us up from the mud and the slime and filth of our pride and our sin, of our selfishness. And he wants to stand us up in his presence, forgiven, redeemed, and empowered, and equipped for a new life, and equipped to take the message to others, to take hope to the world. Jesus was raised Lord, and Jesus wants to raise you too. The gospel message doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Now another obstacle, one more obstacle that I've found that keeps us from evangelism, if you're an introvert like me and shy like me, you might find it hard to open up with people and talk to them about the good news. I have this theory that God designed Christian ministry in such a way that it stretches all of us and pushes us, all of us, outside of our comfort zones. Extroverts, the outgoing people, they read uh, verses 5 and 6 of our passage and they say, 
talking to people, conversation. Hey, where do I sign up? That's great. But then they might have more trouble with the quiet time with God and the, the prayer time, and the solitude and the reading of the Bible and reading all the Christian books. On the other hand, introverts like me, we, we think of curling up with a Bible commentary as a little slice of heaven on earth and quiet time and solitude. Hey, that's great. Where do we sign up? But wait, wait a minute. We also have to go out and, and uh, interact with people, real people with their problems and their, the messiness of their lives. Hmm. We all have to stretch a little bit, don't we? Because the introvert's love for quiet time and reading and solitude, what are those things for if not as preparation for communicating with others. And the evangelistic conversations that the extroverts love so much, what good are those if the extrovert doesn't have a good grasp of what he or she wants to offer people and tell people? In his first letter, John sums up evangelistic conversation nicely. He writes, we have fellowship with God the Father and with Jesus. And in order for our joy to be complete, we proclaim the message to you so you can share in that fellowship too. In the end, that's really what it's all about, isn't it? Discovering the delight of communing with God and telling others so that they can have that delight and blessing in their lives as well. Now in conclusion, the process is clear. Everything we begins with prayer because it doesn't depend on us, the great truth of the Reformation. Everything comes from the grace and power of God. <coughs> and the prayer, <clears throat> our prayer is that God will open doors for his word and will open our mouths to speak at the right time. And then while we're praying, we watch. We watch for those opportunities. We watch so that we can redeem the time. We look for that right moment and the right people that we can bless by sharing with them. And then when God opens that door and gives us that, that opportunity, we redeem the time. We act quickly. We take advantage of the brief moment that God gives us, that brief window. And then finally, when we act, our acting is a matter of speaking. Speaking with grace and so looking for just the right word to say to this person at this moment. Maranatha Church, you are the salt of the earth, but no grain of salt is going to help anyone while it stays in the salt shaker. And in the title of a famous book on evangelism, we need to move out of the salt shaker and into the world. Now, we are trying to do that in Mexico City, and every so often we send you updates by email, and we put things online for you. But nothing would encourage us more if we could get an update from some of you telling us how you persevered in prayer, how you kept watch, how you redeemed the time, how you spoke with grace and salt, and then how God used that to redeem lives and build up his church. Thank you again for your support and prayers. And we want to thank you for being a part of our ministry and allowing us to be an extension of your ministry. Let's pray. Father, we believe. Help our unbelief. Draw us to yourself so that we might rediscover the delight of spending time with you in communion and fellowship with you. And then when we've discovered that and we've spent our time with you, send us back out to speak with grace and soul. Open doors for us to preach your word so that the mystery of Christ will not be as mysterious anymore to the people who need to hear it. That the time that we have on this earth might be redeemed and so that our neighbors and people around the world might be redeemed as well. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our song of response is Hear the Call of the Kingdom. <clears throat>